and welcome to the new property show. I'm Steve McManaman and in this show, TJ on construction, our panel will discuss why get into real estate, but first, Anthony talks about buying businesses. Anthony, welcome back to the new property show. As always, great to have you as a guest. Thanks for having me. Uh, today's topic, we're going to talk about buying businesses, um, what that looks like, and of course, the revenue streams that come with it. Mm. Uh, do you want to just give us a few examples of what businesses nowadays will look like, yep. and maybe a couple of deals you've settled recently? Yeah, so there's some interesting businesses out there. You can make it from anything. Um, the ones that I'm seeing that banks are sort of liking are the ones that are ongoing revenue. So they're locked in subscriptions, whether it's you know, membership based, mm -hmm. like gyms, as much as I love gyms. Um, I'm seeing a few dog washes come through. So actually fit outs of dog washes across, you know, different petrol stations and you might see some in different properties. They're actually doing pretty well, seeing the financials. Um, yeah, so anything that's subscription based and it's ongoing, locked in revenue, perfect. You're thinking weekly, monthly, quarterly, what's the best subscription model to get? Look, I mean, week, the, the frequency, the more frequency you have during the year, better, but I'm seeing a lot monthly, um, especially like, you know, memberships and not, not just gyms, like, you know, for, I don't know, whether it's networking groups or something like that, the, the monthlies are quite good. Because when you have, it's like in building, you know, you don't, a lot of banks don't like builders because, and oh, look, I love builders, but they have real chunky income at one go. What banks want to see, and look, banks are conservative, you've got to sell it to them is they want ongoing revenue constantly. They want, you know, money coming through, like income. It's week. almost like a, not necessarily a service provided um, income, but really is just like, it's almost like a passive. Yeah. But yeah. where the customer's paying to play, yep. uh, rather than the builder or, for example, the business having to do the work and then getting a big chunk. Correct. Uh, because yeah. that's based on results. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, other yeah, one's yeah. Um, based on consistency. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So, um, how do you analyse a business? What, how much do you lend on a business? So let's say you want to buy a fish and chip shop, yep. it's $100,000. Yep. Uh, what should you really be putting at stake? Yep. So, I mean, look, banks always want property. Mm -hmm. Well, our job as brokers is to try to reduce the amount of security you have to provide. Sometimes you do, depending on the industry. So every industry has their different LVRs or loan-to-value ratio. Um, for a fish and chip shop, look, I've seen with a property can fund up to 100%. Without a property about 50% um, funded. Uh, it go on the strength of whether you're gonna, like there's a lot of different factors. The business financials, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the profit, what add backs can be, so depreciation, interest expense. Um, plus if a spouse or, you know, the person that's gonna buy is still gonna be working their job, can we use that income to then sustain the debt? So okay, it's on what servicing. About, uh, and how many people say they buy a business uh, how many people then go and work in that business or are they just getting managers to, to look yeah, after it? It depends on the industry. Like I'm finding, so um, I've been doing a lot of Snap Fitnesses purchases and I'm finding a lot of them are going to put managers in there. They don't particularly want to work in there. Uh, for cafes um, and dog, obviously dog washers, they don't, they don't work in there. But um, for cafes, they're the actual person that's going to be, you know, the front of house or fish and chip shop, they're going to be mm -hmm. working in there. I find the... Um, yeah, the, the fitness industry and... So anything in the food-related industry is typically... Hands-on. ...more of a passion. Yeah. Um, and yep. you need to, to cook the chef, you need someone at the front. Yeah. Um, but in a fitness, what they're doing is really just buying a space. Yeah. Providing an equipment. Yeah. Making a subscription-based model. Mm -hmm. And then putting managers in there and then getting onto their second, third, fourth purchases. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, for example, so any other things that are popular at the moment. So you've mentioned the dog washers, so laundry mat's still around. Is there any other passive income stream options that you recommend? Yeah, I've seen, so gyms are, are quite popular at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, laundry mats have sort of dropped off. There was a time where it was peaking. Um, childcare centres, that's something I've seen a bit of a popularity come through. And it starts from the build up. So, you know, you've got to fund the construction and then the actual, sometimes they want to float the business as well. Um, yeah. Something I'm seeing a bit in the city is um, it was almost like a bubble tea. Yep. Um, <laughs> but I did see yeah. the other day, it was near um, near Collins Street. Yeah. Uh, but I saw quite a line. Yeah. Um, I guess people are fascinated by it. Yeah. But self serve, yeah. you get to make your own drink. Uh, but I looked at it and I thought that's actually not a bad income revenue stream, mm. um, apart from filling the thing up. But yeah. um, do you have any, you had, you've had like experience in the vending machine industry? Yeah. yeah. yeah so there's a few vending machines out there. Um, and all you're doing is maybe once a week refilling whatever the stock is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, 
and you can put multiple everywhere. Sometimes you'll get to a point where you might have to leave your full-time job to do that, but you can, could you say it's passive, semi-passive, yeah? Because if you have maybe two or three around the city, you're constantly just filling up what needs to be done. And the bubble teas, I'm seeing a lot of them online, yeah. Okay, so uh, if somebody comes to you with a business opportunity, yep. uh, as a broker, obviously, you've got to put that forward to the bank. Yep. Um, and really they should be getting checked by their accountant, but you've got to read the books as well. Correct. Um, how easy is, is it for you to pick up if those books have been modified or not or been inflated? Yeah, it's, it's, it is an interesting one. So as brokers, we're meant to cross-check stuff, so we look at bank statements. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at buying an existing business, I would always recommend try to get the bank statements of the transactions for the last six months. It doesn't have to, but if you want to really do your due diligence on purchasing existing business, you want to lift the bonnet up. You want to know mm. what, if it's actually, if the financial say, I don't know, 100 grand turnover, you want to see there's $100,000 coming through. Um, you really need to do due diligence because if, if, let's say you buy the business and then all of a sudden the, the 100,000 turns 70,000, that's $30,000 gone. I think the hardest thing too with owning a business, really apart from just providing the service, mm. you have to know the, the books. Um, yeah. When you've got a, for example, you bought a protein-based business and mm. it was a protein shop, mm. you've got so much inventory, mm -hmm. so many items, you've got a cost yeah. of sale, yeah. um, you've got an acquisition cost and you've got marketing. Yeah. The margins are pretty small there. You almost yeah. need to be a forensic accountant to, <laughs> to work through it. Yeah, um, yeah. I think that's some of the reasons that businesses may fail sometimes. Yeah. I always say it's about the support network you have, and I keep mm -hmm. posting on social media about this. You know, it's the right, if you have the right connection, so the right finance broker, the right accountant, the right bookkeeper, mm -hmm. you can essentially, and the right business broker as well, to actually <clears throat> do the purchase, you essentially can do whatever's required, and lawyer, I should say. Yeah. Would you invest, well, sorry, would you suggest that a, uh, a person might be in real estate at the moment, they've, they've owned a few properties, should actually try their hand at buying a business or should we stay out of it? No, nah, get into it. Yeah. I always, <laughs> always have a crack all the time. You know, yeah. the, what's, what's the harm? You, you know, uh, if, you're, if you're starting up, I mean, what's your, what are you gonna, t what are you gonna try and buy, a existing real estate business yeah. or start up a real estate business? You know, it's, you gotta make sure that you're taking the right risks of your current circumstances. So good, um, good advice there with going to a business broker. I think that's obviously important. Yep. And fundamentally knowing your numbers. Yep. Um, and then you'll work with your clients all the way through. Yes, do a definitely. review. Yep. Uh, and then obviously look at opportunities with how you can increase their yield. Yep. Uh, and then obviously go again. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Which is cool. Yeah. Anything else you wanna share with the audience before we wrap up for today? Um, look, always, you said it perfectly, the yield. Yep. Um, it's all on what's a return on investment. When it's investment and, and business is investment essentially, it's all on the numbers. No motion to it. What's the number say? Do due diligence. Make sure it's right. Go forward with the purchase. Excellent. Congratulations and good to see you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. TJ, welcome to the new property show. Thank you. Uh, so you're a builder, yep. um, kind of a developer really. You do renos, do yep. a few yep. things. Um, you're based down in the Gippsland region. Yep. Um, do you want to tell us a bit about your companies and, and what you do? Yeah, so we've got two companies, um, as we've already discussed, but uh, we've got First Avenue Construction, so it's a new homes, uh, extensions, renovations and commercial fit-outs. Mm -hmm. And then we've got Lineal Homes, which is a new home only company. Uh, and they have, basically with that one, we have a range of plans for clients to look at, um, fully customisable, sort of, I call it a look-alike volume builder. We have the plans and everything there, but we're a custom home builder. We yeah, and it's just for options, really. With, with that one there, how yep. do your customers find you? Have you gone and built a display home yet, or are you selling no. uh, at your office, or how yeah, do people... Yeah, look, it's, at the moment for us, it's all website-based, yep. um, social media, that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, a display home and that sort of things would be lovely one day. Who would knows? Be good. But at the moment, it's all website-based, yeah. Okay, and uh, with those types of builds there uh, for Lilium, so uh, what size homes are you typically selling? Uh, anything, sort of three or four bed, two bath, yep. um, you know, somewhere between, I would say the average is 20 to 25 squares, yep. yeah, somewhere around there. So your average size family home, yeah. And what's the advantages of someone using your company? So a little bit more flexibility, um, they get to come on site. Why would they build with you guys? Yeah, we, um, we offer obviously fully customised plans. So you can come in, change whatever you like. We're quite flexible during the build, we'll change as we go as well. Mm -hmm. So we don't just say no, like, yep. you know, variations and things like that. Obviously, you're hmm. familiar with the new home process, so it, it, um, Very hard. <laughs> yeah, it can be quite difficult. Um, so we're quite flexible on that, on that front. 
uh, you you deal directly with me. So I'm the builder, you deal with me. Um, so you're one on one with the client and the builder. Um, there's no supervisors or anything like that. So you're coming direct to me. So anything, any concerns, any ideas of variations and things like that you want, you know, it's coming directly to me. There's no communication breakdown. So and, you're um, on uh, you're yeah. on site quite a bit. I, obviously, then you're coordinating all the chippies and making sure the slabs are poured. Uh, yep. What part of the building process <clears throat> do you enjoy the most? Well, that's a really good question. I reckon the probably the frame stage. Yeah, I would say the frame stage. Um, there's a there's a massive difference really quickly. So you, you've got a concrete slab or yep. maybe a subfloor on the ground ready to go, and then all of a sudden there's walls and roofs and things, and people can get a feel for their house and actually how big it might be. Um, and I think that's probably the most enjoyable part. I'd probably go. I'd agree with you. Um, frame when you start getting um, the walkthrough. Yep. And then the day the pla then the day the plaster starts to go on. Yeah. Um, really gives it some gives the skeleton some shape and yep. get a little bit of meat. Um, and the other I would also add on for myself would be when the cabinetry starts going in. When you start yep. putting kitchens in, uh, and you really start to fill it out. She's it's halfway there, and uh, it, it's you know, it's still exciting. So. With a with a client, they find that you find them sneaking on a side, or you're actually just working with them all the way through. Uh, no, we're quite happy to have an yep. open door policy. So, yep. there, you know, we prefer a bit of communication. But you know, mm -hmm. clients we've had one recently where they actually lived about an hour and a half, two hours away. So any chance they got to go to look at it, you know, this is where the key is. Mm -hmm. You know, in a lockbox, it's safe out the back. Grab it, go have a look, wander through your home, you know, and take your family with you and enjoy it. Um, you've got to enjoy the process. And you're also saying you're um, building a little place called Locksport at the moment, yes. which um, is a sleepy little town I used to go to. Yeah. Done a few New Year's there back in the day. Yep. Um, but uh, why are people building out there at the moment? Uh, it's, good. it's a good retirement place. Uh, so especially pre-COVID, uh, blocks were relatively cheap. You, know, you can still pick up a block of land in, down there about 60 grand. Uh, they've definitely gone up a little bit now. I think the lowest is around about 100 now. Um, so it's gone up a little bit, but it was a cheap place to build. Um, so people go down there. It's got all the facilities. Uh, there's now a doctor in town and that sort mm -hmm. of stuff. So for a retirement sort of thing, you're right on the beach. It's not very high end as far as price goes. So it's a cheap place to get into. And um, I think it's just a nice, relaxed little town. I think um, for any of these Melbourne viewers watching here, you can't even buy a bathing box in Melbourne for 100000 <laughs> Yeah. Um, and yep. you're getting a whole buck of land. And yep. um, it, it does make sense, really, um, because w what we find in Melbourne sometimes is people selling million-dollar properties. Yep. And they would typically move into Queensland. But if you want to stay in Victoria, because they would generally come back anyway, yeah. get to a little place like Locksport or Seaspray or Golden Beach yep. um, and, and probably get a house and land for maybe four hundred grand. Yeah. Um, which is really good value. Yep. So uh, what are you seeing in 2024 happening uh, with the building industry? Like, is if you guys are incurring any challenges at the moment? Do you think you're going to be building more houses or less? Uh, I would say less. Yeah. Uh, I think it has slowed a little. We're still getting good inquiry, which is nice, mm -hmm. but it has definitely slowed a little. Um, the, the inquiry we're getting, I think, is, is good in the sense that it's um, people are now willing to spend a little bit more mm -hmm. money on... Those items that we think are important, such as your energy efficiency and that sort of, the design aspect of it, um, people seem to be concentrating on that. And I think with the cost of living pressures going up, people mm -hmm. are more fixated on how can I save money long term rather than just initially buying a house. And would you recommend for any of the young viewers out there watching uh, that they should be a builder? Uh, should they do sales or be a builder? Oh, <laughs> it depends on the person. <laughs> it I think. does. Like I, yeah. you know, I've done both. Yeah. Um, I've done both. For me, being a builder is the best thing. Yeah. Um, I would not change it for the world. So I, I think it depends on the person. You know, sales, well, I've done sales before. It wasn't for me. Yeah. Obviously, I do a bit of sales still like with my own companies, but I've actually worked for a volume builder before doing it. Um, and, yeah, definitely. I, you know, if you love housing, I think, and you're handy, like, on the tools, you like being outside, working with people, I think being on the tools and being outside and being a builder is the best 100%. way to go. 100%. And I think, too, look, everybody pays a part. Um, yep. Somebody's obviously got to sell them, somebody's yep. got to put the bricks up, somebody's got to do the frame, somebody's got to do the electrical. Yep. But I think the, the real um, answer there sits in um, building a new home, it really just comes into your passion. Yep. Uh, and I think as long as you're involved in the process, it's uh, fulfilling. Uh, it's great to see you doing such a good job out there. Uh, we'd love to share your website, talk about that, and obviously get you back on. Yep. And love to get the cameras out there and actually um, show some of your workmanship as well. Yeah, no, that's... That'll be fine. Anytime we've got a guy that comes in here and does 
the social media stuff for us. So happy to have the boys are used to cameras too now. So <laughs> yeah, happy to have anybody out to check it out any time. Beautiful. Well, yep. thanks again for jumping on the new property show, and we look forward to having you again soon. Sounds great. Thank you. <clears throat> happy, with the, happy, happy with the time? Rolling. Yeah, I like that, but can we do a, some more? On um, which one? Uh, I'm interested to find out what's happening with the building code next year. Yeah, sure. And also, um, um, you know, has it changed? Well, talk about the energy. Concept? Well, you said energy efficiency. So talk about some of the new things that people are asking for. It's what he's, he wants to go. Yep. No, so I that could actually, be... I was, actually, I was actually trying to say, you know, and the, there was typically... We COVID with del material delivery. Yep. How's that changed? So those two. Are you having issues with supplies and trades? How about that? Yeah. How about yeah. we touch on that? Yeah. Because yeah, trades yeah. is a big one. Great. Okay. Yep. Okay. Go for it. Cool. Yeah. So TJ, are you? Um, obviously, we've discussed building codes are going to be changing. Yep. Uh, and um, you mean COVID? Yep. Uh, then we've come with supply issues with getting deliveries yes. and trades, okay? Yes. It's almost a whole other uh, segment. <laughs> yep, um, but what are some of the challenges at the moment? Uh, are trades still turning up or are they charging through the roof? Or what's happening there? Yeah, um, for us, in my opinion and for, and for what I experience, we've built a pretty good base of trades. So we've, had, we've never had an issue getting guys to site. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we work with the same crews all the time. So for us, that's been good. There's definitely people screaming for trade still, um, trying to find people um, to, to complete the work that they've got on. But for us, that hasn't been a problem. The materials has definitely gotten better. There's um, a couple of things here and there where, you know, might be two or three or four weeks. But, yeah, nothing like the three or four months we were seeing at some point. Um, Prices are stabilised on that front too, which is making it easier for us to get into the contracts and estimate it, like, you know, and actually giving people fixed prices and, and good prices up front. So we kind of, we know it's not going to fluctuate too much now, or we, we hope. <laughs> what about the building code? Um, yep. Do you know much about what's happening in 2024? There's a few yeah, new there's changes There's a couple coming. of changes there, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, the biggest ones are around energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. So they're going to the seven stars. And there's also the livability side of it. So better access for people with um, mobility issues. That Yeah, so things like larger landings for entries and things like that, uh, stepless showers and those sort of stuff. A lot of builders probably do a lot of that anyway, um, but there are going to be in increases on room sizes and things like that that will affect what can be built on what land, and, and especially around garages and things because we require more space around those now. So there's going to be a little bit of a change there. The energy efficiency side, moving to seven stars, um, the idea being that we will have better performing homes and obviously bringing down your bills, whether it was gas or electricity, whatever it might be. Well, actually, we're all going to electricity next mm -hmm. year anyway because they're getting rid of the gas. But, it's um, yeah, it's going to be around about that. So you're going to see a lot more double glazing and that sort of thing, um, probably better performing insulation and better I think that's the biggest products. thing there is getting rid of the gas next year is certainly going to be yeah, a big change. A um, looks like they're um, separate again, but it looks like the whole of Australia is really going to undergo that change. <laughs> yeah, well, possibly, um, yeah. And, yep. uh, you mean, I, I prefer to cook on gas anyway, yep. but it's, um, I think... There's going to be significant um, significant costs that are going to come through. Uh, I guess some government initiatives, but a few people fighting uh, fighting it. So, mm. uh, yes. be uh, be curious to see it in 2024 in terms of what goes on there. Yep. But yeah, thanks sure. again. Uh, really informative. Can't wait to uh, to hear about it. And I think the I guess the changes are necessary. We've got an aging population at the yep. moment, um, and we really should be taking care of the elderly, and we should be building the houses for the future. So. Yeah, great yeah, topic. And I think that's exactly it, is it's building it for the future. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. This week's debate, or really story, is why. Uh, why did you get into real estate? What were your passions behind it? And uh, what was the ultimate decision? So, I'm a buyer's advocate. I work for Code Green Advisory. And um, how I got into the industry was I was a nurse for many years. And I actually found that um, through the hard time of COVID, there was actually a lot of people with savings sitting in the bank. And I thought it was a great opportunity. Um, me, I bought my first uh, property when I was 21. I was owner builder and built my dream home. Um, and from then I leveraged that to buy investment properties. And I just wanted to share that ability to be able to do that with other people. And how I started doing that was on my own ward. 
I work at a, a major hospital and I found that yeah, being able to discuss um, property was one of the things I love to talk about and a lot of people didn't know much about it. So I just said, oh, you've got 100,000 sitting in the bank, how about I help you buy a property? And then, um, yeah, so that's how I got into the property space, um, teaching people how to buy property and then supporting them through the journey to buy their dream home and then um, use property as a vehicle to um, continue buying property and reach financial freedom, especially ladies. I've got a real passion for helping women so and empowering women. Were you talking to the staff or the patients? Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> I was talking, well, the best thing was talking to the surgeons. <laughs> the surgeons, anaesthetics, <laughs> anyone yeah. that's uh, wanted to listen. But yeah, the, I wasn't in critical care, so yeah. I just yeah, found that yeah. I could talk to the patients if yeah. they wanted to. I was often seeking out advice in different areas. If I didn't know an area, I'd be like, oh, you're from that area. I'm going to do a bit of background research in this. and um, It's fun, isn't yeah, it? So yeah, so it is fun. Talking yeah. property is fun if you've got someone with a similar passion. Yeah. But my passion is, yeah, helping, helping people and uh, find, uh, finding financial freedom through buying property, using that as a vehicle is one of the things I like to do. And that's how I got into the space and Co Green Advisory took off from there. What about you, Shireen? What, what happened? What was your story? Uh, so mine's a little bit different to that, but I was I started my own business, and so uh, in between the events that we were, were doing for this business, uh, I was working in a, a uh, retail job, and I was serving a lady, and obviously I sold. It was just in a shoe shop, and it was like just in between. And anyway, I'd probably stitched her up for about four pairs of shoes, and she goes, "Oh my God, you really should be in real estate." and and one thing led to another, and so a lot of people will go into real estate, and, you know, I, when we interview them for, for jobs and things, and people will describe themselves as having a passion for property. And it's like property is just a byproduct of what we do. For me, it's a passion for people, because I think mm -hmm. that, you know, when, when we're engaging at them at that level and obviously helping them to achieve that goal, like we are very close, working very closely with them in their lives, and we're, tr we're trying to help them you know, reach their next ch chapter of life or whatever it might be that, that, that they're doing. So we become, you know, we almost have these little short-term short relationships with all of our clients, be it buyers or, or vendors. And, you know, for me, it was always just about being able to help them and to be able to give them, um, you know, solid advice and not to have, a, you know, as an agent, not to have my best interest at heart and to always put the client first. So. For me, it was a no-brainer to, to actually go into property. What about you, Dawn? What happened there? So, I'm a nurse as well. Uh, you didn't need, you didn't, you two didn't meet, did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> On the ward, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> I work in intensive care yeah. and mm. had always been interested in investing in property with my partner. And I got really sick of uh, seeing people fall for traps of buying dud properties mm -hmm. off the plan. Uh, and I really felt like the buyer's agency space needed some honesty and uh, just shooting people straight mm -hmm. about how they can make money in property, teaching people that, you know, selling agents are not your friend. Their job is not <laughs> to work mm -hmm. for you. Their job is to work you. So mm -hmm. and it's just for me, it's about educating people to make solid investments that will perform for them over the long term following the strategy that we did and that you know you don't have to be a multi-millionaire to invest in property but what property can do for you is that it can get you back time with your family your friends and follow your passions mm. so you're thinking more about the um the end in mind in terms of what it can create yep 100 percent because if I was to do a master's, let's say in nursing, I would only make an extra 10K a year. Whereas if I'm investing in a property that's only $300,000, we've seen over the space of a couple of years, those properties grow to 500,000 and cost almost nothing to hold. So for me, it's a no brainer. I used to work on the theory that you'd, you mean, you'd easily spend $50 in, you mean for a meal and that $50 can go towards really, even if it was negatively geared, holding a $300,000 property um, and you get a tax deduction and it's for savings. Um, mm. And I think sometimes, and we'll discuss this on one of the other panels, but buying low is the way to go <laughs> because you can, actually, um, you can actually buy more properties. It gives you a fair bit of leverage and also if you need to sell the property, you can get out of it as well. Um, over to you, Kylie. Spot on. I've loved hearing um, everyone talk about 
their passion and their drive to, to help people. And that's exactly why I'm in real estate as well. I'm a sales agent uh, down at Ray White Diamond Creek. And that's what I want to do is I always want to assist people with their, their next mm -hmm. phase. It could be downsizing, upsizing, first home buyers, investing, um, and, and working through with my vendors to, to get that, that best result and, and know that they've got someone on their side. And I've really loved hearing that everyone has that same same drive as to, to help mm -hmm. people. I don't think everyone does in, in the broad Broader yeah. industry, yeah. Uh, so it really is. Um, yeah, it's really breathtaking to hear you all with that same same mental sense of we just want to help people achieve their goals and very very passionate about it and strategic. I think it comes down to the thing I'm noticing here is it's all about service, um, and that's really serving people. Some people, as I said, really just like to receive and they want to be the customer. In this case, you've seen an opportunity to do something better. Um, I'd been buying property myself since I was 18, so I was buying established properties and I already had a passion for property. But the pivotal moment that made me make a decision, I was, um, I was doing car sales and selling a lot of cars and I went to build a house and I knew I went to the builder three times, um, had the deposit in my pocket the first time, I got really bad service. Second time, guy laughed at me for my budget and I said, well, I don't know, like, you just tell me what I need to spend. Third time I went in there, knew the plan I was going to buy and said, sorry, I'm busy and I left um, and went and bought it from a competitor, went back there and put the contract on the desk and said, mate, if this is what you do, <laughs> I reckon I could do it 10 times better. Um, end up building a house with the other company and quit my job and thought he doesn't deserve a job. So I actually sold against him to the point that I got a phone call from that, uh, from that major building company, said, can you please stop doing this to us? You're actually taking all that business. I said, well, you guys need to know how to serve properly. Um, and that actually fired me up. So I think it said sometimes like, um, I mean, the situational awareness, but um, it's always about opportunity. That's all for this week. Thank you for being with us. If you'd like to see our full episodes, please check out our website, thenewpropertyshow.tv. And we'll see you guys again next week.